I think we'll go ahead and get started, um, just to keep everybody on time so we can get outside and um, enjoy some sunshine after this wonderful plenary. Um, welcome and good afternoon. Thank you all for being here and for joining us throughout the day. It's been, uh, in my estimation, a really wonderful morning and early afternoon, and I thank you all for being here. Welcome to Plenary 3, Defensive Sovereignty, Property, Race, and Resistance. My name is Angela Riley, and I'll be the moderator for the panel. Excuse me. Um, what I'd like to do first is just give a couple of comments to frame the panel, and then I'll introduce the speakers in the order in which they will give their presentations and then turn it over to them. Uh, each speaker will have 15 minutes maximum to talk, and uh, at that point I'll ask one question, and then we will open it up to the floor. So let me just begin by giving you a little uh, a, a taste of what the panel is about. Uh, this panel is intended, we actually thought that by this point in the conference that um, sovereignty might need a little boost. Um, that sovereignty might need, 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 some, need a fan club and part of the idea behind this panel was to talk about some of the positive attributes of sovereignty. Um, but really we've had, I think, a great um, mix of viewpoints on sovereignty, self-determination, and other concepts throughout the conference. Um, but my panelists here have very nuanced and complicated and complex thoughts on sovereignty. So I will, I will let them get to those. But just a little bit about the panel. Um, the panel is intended to engage the question of how sovereignty, and specifically as articulated by indigenous groups or even other minority populations, can be used as a way to assert rights to self-determination, identity, and peoplehood. This panel will engage the question of how sovereignty may be used defensively as a form of resistance, um, particularly as asserted by groups who have previously been excluded from the for formation of the nation state in which they find themselves in a post-colonial period. So throughout the morning and early afternoon, we've heard some critiques of sovereignty and have to varying degrees engaged its costs particularly insofar as it figures in questions of anti-racism, social justice, and inclusion. And this panel is going to look more closely at a narrative of sovereignty and its connection to race, property, and identity. Now I'd like to introduce the panelists in the order that they'll give their presentations. I'm just going to give a very brief introduction of each person and then refer you to the materials in the book so that you can read their full bios. So first we have Sarah Krakoff, who's a professor at University of Colorado Law School. Then Rose Villazor, professor at Hofstra University School of Law. Julia Nagan, Chamorro activist, author, and lawyer. Catherine Irons, Professor of Law at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand, and Rebecca Sosi, Professor at Arizona State University Law School. And I should just add that it is my pleasure to moderate this panel not only because I really admire the work of all of these people here, but because I've had the opportunity to um, become friends and colleagues with many of them over the years, um, and it's just really delightful to see them again and all together at one time. So please join me in welcoming them, and Sarah Craigoff will lead off. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to Angela and the other members of the Critical Race Theory Program here at UCLA. Uh, this has been a terrific conference and, and day so far. Um, and I, I have to confess to feeling sort of overstimulated and, um, and also uh, I'm very impressionable and so uh, <laughs> throughout the day I kept shifting. Now, oh wow, yeah, I'm going to frame this all through the settler colonialism frame. No, indigeneity. So, um, so forgive me if, uh, if you're, all of the previous discussions have influenced me too much. I, I also think um, to try to counter that, I think at this time of day it's best to try to be somewhat simple. Uh, I'm just going to maybe lay out a few uh, key things I want to convey right now so that when you, if you're like me and you start to space out in the rest of the 15 minutes, I'm going to time myself too, um, you will at least have heard the few key things that I'm trying to do with this project. Um, so I, I think I fit into this panel because prior work I've done um, really does resonate with the theme of defensive sovereignty. Um, and in, in particular, one, one article was an interrogation of how the Navajo Nation has uh, adapted to the federal law of, of tribal sovereignty and nonetheless um, forged its own definitions of what it is to be uh, an indigenous nation um, on the one hand using the, the framework of the federal law of sovereignty as 
imperfect and flawed as it is by its colonial past, um, to nonetheless uh, create what I think of as sort of the protective shell around the perpetuation of indigenous cultural, religious, spiritual, and um, economic life um, in, 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 in a robust form, right? Not just in a sort of keeping the old things around kind of form, but in a, this is a living, breathing nation perpetuating its own culture. So that's my prior work. And then in, maybe in a bait and switch, <laughs> Um, I use this opportunity for this conference to really think about another idea that's been on my mind, um, something that I see as sort of a, a deficiency in um, general understandings of the construction of uh, American Indian tribes. Um, and so the, to the, the title of this paper, which is in a very early stage, which I'm afraid means that my thoughts about it are still a bit scattered, but nonetheless, here, here's my attempt to be simple. So the title is Inextricably Political Tribal Membership, Race, and Sovereignty. Um, and what it interrogates is how federally recognized tribes came to be, the federally recognized tribes that they are, um, how that historical process is infused with, of course, power politics and the racial construction of tribes. Um, and then, you know, hopefully, uh, what, what implications that has for today for um, legal doctrine, right? What, what, what should we think about and do with the received legal doctrine given this history? Um, and, you know, what hopefully it will sort of uh, equip us to make better and more nuanced arguments about um, how truly political tribes and tribal membership are given this history. And that um, if federal courts in particular uh, attempt to unravel this history, it's my view that they will mess it up, um, that they will not do a good job. And I am very mistrustful of the federal courts right now and how they would approach questions about um, federal Indian law for reasons that um, I'm sure most of you in this room know, and if not, um, I can give you a bunch of sites and you can go start <laughs> reading. Okay, so that, that, that was what I was interested in interrogating. And so I had in my mind um, a couple of regions and a couple of tribes in particular that I thought these would be very good case studies. Um, and they are um, the Colorado River Indian tribes that are in uh, southern Arizona, uh, and that's one federally recognized tribe, but for reasons that will become clear soon, um, they are, their name is the Colorado River Indian tribes with an S on the end. Um, uh, and that, uh, well, I'll talk more about that in a second. And then the second region, which I'm really not, uh, just in the interest of time, gonna talk much about at all today, but will be in the larger project, um, are the many tribes, the several tribes, of what was once the great Dakota Nation, or we, you know, non-Indians um, will more typically call the Great Sioux Nation. Um, and they tell two different stories. Um, so the Colorado River Indian tribes, or for short, CRIT, uh, are a story of several different linguistic, ethnic, political groups um, squished together on one reservation in southern Arizona by the federal government. Um, and so um, the CRIT are composed of the Mojave, Chimpeve, uh, and also now Navajo and Hopi uh, people who are all up from those different groups, um, who are all members of the federally recognized Colorado River Indian tribes. So just from that alone, you can probably see how that shores up the idea that tribes are indeed, membership is indeed political, right? I mean, because that's several different racial, ethnic, linguistic groups right there in one federally recognized Indian tribe. Um, and then in the Dakota Nation, and this will be about all I say um, about uh, that aspect of the paper for now, uh, it's sort of the opposite phenomenon. There are, it's uh, s several different linguistic, cultural, um, and political peoples who have an, some overarching commonalities um, and, and in some respects conceived of themselves as one people um, with, 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 some, with some important distinctions and exceptions, but who were then spread out and separated into, uh, in the two states I'm looking at, ten different federally recognized tribes. Um, and some of those tribal groupings track with or accord with linguistic and cultural affiliation, but not all of them. A lot of these were just sort of military decisions, and I'm sure as many of you know, uh, reservations were carved up based on where military forts were in many cases, right? Um, and so that had very little to do with what the uh, people who spoke, say, Nakota, thought about where their homeland was or where they, they should end up. Um, it was just sort of a political military decision. Um, and so that tells a sort of different story about the, politi the 
politics at the formation of what become federally recognized tribes. Um, now, before I go further, um, I'll say that a, a working assumption of the paper is that tribal sovereignty as it exists today for tribes is crucial, again, hearkening back to my previous work, for the perpetuation of um, a living indigenous culture. So that's just a background assumption. So as we go back into the somewhat um, inevitably seamy history of how tribes were constructed in large part by um, the, the colonial aspects of our nation in its effort to build a nation. I, I, I don't want to lose sight of that, but we have to, you know, we have to tell this story. Um, so I'm going to omit for now also the doctrinal framing, but happy to um, pick up on any questions about the legal framing later in the Q&A, because I really want to get to um, the story of these, of the Colorado River Indian tribes, which I think will tell the theoretical and legal story on its own. Um, so the Colorado River Indian tribes um, today um, are composed, the tribe is composed of 3,786 active tribal members. Um, as I said, they're Mojave, Chemehuevi, Navajo, and Hopi. Um, I tried to actually find out how many um, from each grouping uh, there are, but, um, and this is one of the uh, completely, to me, understandable difficulties of doing research in Indian country. Um, the tribal enrollment officer uh, told me she couldn't give me that information, and the tribal council actually voted on whether or not this, you know, egghead researcher at the University of Colorado could have access to that data, and they voted no, and I respect that. Um, but uh, it just leads to, I think, the need for a field trip to go down there and, and just start talking to people. Um, and uh, now the segue is a lot of the information that I have about the history of the CRIT um, comes from a report that was drafted in 1958. And when I read this report, uh, it uh, reinforced further my sense of why the tribes would be so very suspicious of a non-Indian researcher. Um, this report, which is meticulous in its detailing of the history of the tribe's formation um, in 1865 up until the report was drafted and published by the BIA in 1958 um, was undertaken, um, and Indian law nerds in the crowd might be able to guess why from the date, remember the publication date was 1958, it was undertaken for the purposes of considering whether or not the crit could be terminated as a federally recognized mm -hmm. tribe. So, in other words, the last time non-Indian researchers were down there snooping around um, and collecting this information, which is invaluable, as a lot of colonialist anthropology has turned out to be, um, was to terminate the tribe. So, so no wonder they're, they're suspicious, right, and rightly so. Um, but here's the story that we can learn from public documents. Um, so the reservation was established in 1865 um, for the Mojave and Chemehueve, of course, who are still there today, um, but also for other tribes of that region. And uh, a couple of things that I'll pull out from just this initial formation of the Crit Reservation that are important for the story. Um, first, the Mojave and Chemehueve traditionally are um, not, were not on particularly friendly terms. I mean, these are not two peoples who would have themselves decided, hey, we should end up with the same border and as part of the same fairly recognized tribe. Um, the easiest thing to say is that they were traditional enemies, but that doesn't quite capture it and I think is slightly, um, you know, I almost find it almost a racist way to describe. They weren't traditionally e traditional enemies, they just weren't traditional pals, you know, they weren't the same peoples. <laughs> and from time to time had skirmishes, um, right? Just like New York and New Jersey don't want to be in the same state. <laughs> Um, so, um, and I'm from New Jersey, so I know that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so they, th 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 that alone, right, is, is, is part of the political nature of the construction of the federally recognized tribe. Um, other tribes uh, managed not to be uh, retained here on the reservation, and instead, eventually, several of them found their own homelands. Um, but then pressure built uh, in 19, the 1930s, um, particularly starting in 1934, for the Colorado River Indian tribes to accept um, members of other tribes. And the justification was that the Mojave and Chemehueve had too much land. Um, and the way that the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, impressed upon the CRIT that they ought to be accepting, um, and this is fantastic, this term, the colonists from the Navajo and Hopi, this is how they're, <laughs> they're referred to in the documents, um, is that if you don't accept the Navajo and Hopi colonists, 
Uh, the whites are going to, there's going to be too much pressure from white people and we, the BIA, aren't going to be able to protect you. So the BIA, their trustee, um, really um, imposed very coercive kind of measures on the tribe to get them to accept the Navajo and Hopi settlers. And I'll just read you a couple of things to give you a flavor for the attitude of the Bureau of Indian Affairs at this time. Um, this is um, BIA Commissioner John Collier in 1939. What is the nature of your title, if any, to this great area? I think the answer is that nobody quite knows. However, the practically controlling fact is that 100,000 acres are going to be irrigated and you cannot use all of it. Impossible! Exclamation point. It will be used either by Indians or white people. If used by white people, it will soon be owned by white people. From your standpoint and that of Indians as a whole, it is better that Indians be located here. And then another quote from another BIA memo. The Mojaves and Chemehuevis cannot possibly utilize their vast natural resource properly. Careful study of the needs of these Indians, including how those now residing at Needles in Fort Mojave, has led to the conclusion that their present and ultimate land requirements will aggregate but not exceed 25,000 acres of irrigated lands. That leaves a balance of 75,000 acres. Okay, so, so you can see the logic, which very much fits into some of the stories we heard early this morning um, about settler colonialism, right? Where at the heart of it really is access to land and resources. Um, and, and these peoples who have been using these lands uh, wisely and sustainably up until the time of their, you know, being compressed onto this reservation, are now being told, you're going to have to squish even further in or we're gonna, the whites are going to get it. Um, and the justification, by the way, was funding for an irrigation project. Because anyone who knows southern Arizona knows that it's not very good farmland, actually, because it's really hot and dry and there's no water. Um, so the ultimate threat was the BIA saying, we're not going to continue this irrigation project, which we promised you was part of the uh, treaty, um, if you don't take additional people. So I just want to draw a couple of points out of this, because I know I'm running short on time. Um, and just out of this, the, the history so far, and there's so, so much more um, that, you know, hopefully I've intrigued you enough that when I finish this, you'll read the paper. Um, but a few points to pull out. Um, one is just the inherently political nature of the construction of the federally recognized Indian tribe. Um, two, which goes along with it, the particular way in which tribal peoples were racialized in order to uh, be constructed into these federally recognized tribes. Um, and this, you can see the sort of raci racialization um, running throughout the documents, both of the formation in 1865 and the moment of settling the colonists, right? There's this distinction generally between Indians, right? You're better off with other Indians, even folks you don't know, um, than with white people, right? So there's a pan-Indian element to the racialization of Indian people, even at the same time as there is the, the I impossible to extricate in my mind um, mix of the tribal status of Indians and their racial status. Um, so those are just two things I want to pull out um, that I think have implications for our current thinking about legal doctrine. Um, so <coughs> Morton versus Mancari, this famous or I suppose to some people infamous case which, that, which affords rational basis review to classifications um, that are based on the political status of tribes, um, I, I think is about as good as we're going to get and is right in ways that the court really didn't fully appreciate, um, right? I, I, first of all, I don't want, as a practical matter, courts intermeddling with tribal status right now for all kinds of reasons. Um, second, uh, tribal, tribal status really is deeply and inextricably political, I think, as these stories show or will show, hopefully, when I'm done with the work. Um, so, and I, I see that I'm out of time, and so I just think that uh, I can conclude with just two sentences and then be done. Um, and here they are, right? The Colorado River Indian <coughs> tribes and the contemporary tribes that were once part of the Great Sioux Nation demonstrate in distinctive ways the deep and irretrievably political nature of tribal membership, yet contemporary tribal sovereignty, which depends on and generates tribal membership, <coughs> protects indigenous peoples from what otherwise could be the last step towards decimation of their rights to self-determination. Um, the construct of race enters in at various points, initially aiding and then confounding our analysis. Um, how, given the history and present reality, could courts untangle the question of what is truly a political distinction and what is a racial one, given that the enterprise is shot through with politics and how it constructs race?
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I, too, would like to thank the organizers of this uh, wonderful conference. I have learned so much. And like Sarah, I, too, am overstimulated. Um, and, and so I will do my very best to highlight some key points about my paper uh, for today. Um, it's perfect that I follow Sarah because my presentation also relates to federal, federally recognized tribes, uh, but more specifically Morton versus Mankari. But I deviate from that somewhat by talking about the limits of Mankari um, as articulated through Rice versus Cayetano. Uh, being here has uh, given me a, an opportunity, if, if not an excuse, to return to an essay that I wrote uh, three years ago now, uh, which I've been wanting to return to but haven't had the um, real opportunity to do so. So I'm so thankful to be included in this panel, which would allow me to interrogate further some of the issues that I've explored uh, three years ago. Um, in that essay that I published, I wrote about how Morton versus Mankari and Rice versus Cayetano <coughs> constructed a race or political binary that limited the political to federally recognized tribes. Thus, efforts by Native Hawaiians, not federally recognized uh, as a tribe, uh, their efforts to limit the right to vote to Native Hawaiians was viewed by the Supreme Court as, a racially, as racially discriminatory um, and therefore unconstitutional. Um, I want to add that I certainly wasn't the only person who has written about this in this context. Uh, the late Chris Ajima of Hawaii Law School uh, wrote one of the earlier articles about the race versus political binary paradigm. Um, Carol Gold Goldberg has written about it, and then more recently, Addie Rolnick um, as well. So it's great to uh, be in their uh, company. But my intervention here focuses on indigenous uh, peoples in the U.S. territories, and specifically the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands and American Samoa. In the interest of time, I'd like to focus on the Chamorros and Carolinians. Those are the indigenous peoples of the Northern Mariana Islands. I'll use CNMI as a short form for talking about uh, those indigenous peoples there. So my goal is to complicate our understanding of the racial versus political paradigm by exploring what happens when laws that privilege indigenous peoples along bloodlines um, and, and particularly of territorial peoples who are not part of a federally recognized tribe. What happens when we uh, consider their blood quantum laws um, in the context of uh, Morton versus Mankari and Rice versus Cayetano? Um, issues in the U.S. territories to me are very important because uh, people uh, in the U.S. territories tend to be marginalized. They're invisible in many different contexts in constitutional jurisprudence as well as uh, mainstream, mainstream tradici uh, traditional discussions um, about civil rights. And so part of my research agenda has been to highlight some of the unique issues that people in the U.S. territories face. With respect to the Mariana Islands, the CNMI has established a land ownership system that privileges indigenous peoples and non-indigenous peoples who meet certain blood quantum or descent rules. This law has been upheld by courts under the Insular Cases Doctrine. Some of you might be aware of this doctrine. This, this is a doctrine that is generally applied in the U.S. territories context only. The idea is that the U.S. Constitution does not follow the flag and only certain fundamental rights apply in the U.S. territories. So with respect to land ownership laws um, along blood quantum rules, the Ninth Circuit has upheld under the Insular Cases Doctrine the ability of the CNMI people to restrict land ownership to um, along blood quantum uh, rules. But what happens when blood quantum land law in the CNMI is examined, not under the insular cases doctrine, but rather under traditional equal protection law? I argued in my essay previously that under, Mankari, under the Mankari and Rice cases, <coughs> the CNMI blood quantum law would likely be struck down. Because the peoples of the CNMI are not federally recognized tribes, uh, courts would likely consider them as racial groups. Thus, uh, Mankari is uh, overly narrow, overly narrow, because it leads to the construction of indigenous peoples that are not federally recognized tribes as uh, racial groups. It is important then to further explore and interrogate this narrow construction of political indigeneity and consider its complexity and limits in fully addressing the concerns of the CNMI people. For the remainder of my time, I'd like to just focus on two main points. 
I'll concretize my talk by discussing a voting restriction in the CNMI that is linked with their blood quantum land restrictions. I argue that this law is a type of defensive local self-determination that is intended to maintain a group identity uh, who would have control and ownership over their lands. Second, I'll situate the land and attendant legal issues with, uh, related to the voting restriction within the Mankari rice dichotomy and discuss why this law arguably <coughs> violates the Equal Protection Clause as currently defined uh, by the Supreme Court. So let me just tell you uh, some information about the CNMI. The CNMI is a U.S. territory having officially become a U.S. territory in 1986. Prior to that, the Marianas was a trust territory of the UN under the administration of the United States. Unlike the other four U.S. territories, uh, that is Guam, Puerto Rico, American Samoa, and the Virgin Islands, the CNMI people have the option to choose their political status because of the involvement and intervention of the United Nations. The United Nations mandated that the people of the Marianas get to decide and vote on the type of political status that they desire. The people voted to become a self-governing commonwealth of the United States. During the political agreement between the Marianas and the United States, uh, both parties agreed to impose a land alienation restriction that would privilege people in the Marianas. Um, the United States was, in, was concerned about uh, the lack, if a land alienation restriction is not imposed, that uh, people who are uh, foreigners, in particular Japanese, would end up owning all the lands in, this tiny, in the tiny islands of the Marianas. The uh, Marianas people, on the other hand, also wanted to control or to have a land alienation restriction that would privilege their people because um, after having been colonized for over 350 years, they wanted to have uh, to gain their, their lands back and have control over who can um, own their land. So both parties, United States and the Mariana Islands, agreed through their political agreement uh, that there should be some restriction on land ownership. And the United States agreed that the, that the Marianas people get to decide and who those people, who the people of the Northern Marianas would, um, which of the group of the Northern Marianas people would be able to own land. Uh, they also agreed that this land alienation restriction would only be good for up to 25 years. After 25 years, the people of the Marianas then get to decide on whether to lift the restriction on land ownership. Uh, the, uh, the political agreement that both parties signed became effective in 1986. Uh, 25 years later, i.e. 2011, uh, the people of the Marianas now get to decide on whether to keep the land alienation restriction. In 1999, the CNMI legislature passed an amendment to their constitution that would limit the ability to vote on whether to keep the land alienation restriction to only persons who are considered Northern Marianas descent, and in uh, particular, only persons who are of 25% Chamorro or Carolinian blood would be able to vote on whether or not to keep the land alienation restriction. So in other words, the people who were entitled to own land under the political agreement are the very ones right now who have the right to vote on whether to keep the land restriction or not in the first place. Because uh, the, um, the election is months away, there has been a robust and delicate, if not contentious, debate uh, among the people in the CNMI about whether this law should, uh, whether this law should um, be challenged, whether it comports with Rice versus Cayetano and Morton versus Mankari. So what's at stake here? Uh, what's at stake is uh, the small uh, the land mass that we're talking about. Uh, the Saipan is the big island, which is only 14 miles wide and 7 miles north, um, long. It's a very tiny land. There are about 50,000 people in the Mariana Islands, 50% uh, of whom are indigenous. The other 50% are <coughs> non-indigenous, the majority of whom are Filipinos who have been residing there for about between 30 to, uh, between 5 and 30 years. So there's a politically contentious, uh, contentious debate right now about whether uh, U.S. citizens who are not Chamorros or Carolinians should be disenfranchised from voting on this law. I mean, in plain terms, a lot of non-indigenous people want to be able to own land because of uh, the, the length of time that they spent in the Mariana Islands. 
the, uh, both the land alienation restriction as well as the restriction on voting constitute as forms of what I call local self-determination. Um, by that, they, uh, they seek to maintain, create and maintain and reify a group identity. This group identity would be the people who, would be, who are considered persons of Northern Mariana's descent. Um, that comes uh, as, a mem as members of this particular group identity. The members have certain rights, right? The ability to own land, which means be being able to pass down their uh, land ownership, their properties to their children, their grandchildren, um, and also be able to vote on, their, on this land alienation restriction. So in other words, there are very tangible privileges that are accorded to members of people who belong in this group by within this group identity. The problem, and specifically the legal issue that um, has arisen, is because of how this law implicates Rice versus Cayetano. If anything, it's a direct, many argue, uh, that it's a direct application of Rice versus Cayetano. Just like the Native Hawaiian uh, law that's thought to uh, restrict ownership, um, the ability to vote along bloodlines, so to hear in the Marianas context. And so there are a lot of people who are arguably, um, who are contending that the law violates uh, Rice versus Cayetano and the 15th Amendment and equal protection norms, and so therefore should be invalidated. And I should say, though, there's not only indigenous, uh, non-indigenous peoples who are saying this, there are also um, indigenous groups who are willing to invalidate the land alienation restriction to them, they see uh, the law as a paternalistic move by the United States. They want to be able to sell their own land to the highest bidder, um, in particular because when you contextualize it in a place that has been economically underdeveloped, they actually see the land alienation restriction as prohibiting their ability to move forward and to be competitive in the Pacific um, and against their neighboring islands, uh, Guam. So it's a uh, Ultimately, the, Marianas, uh, the Mariana Islands, and specifically the blood quantum land alienation law and the voting restriction, raises some complex issues about the extent <coughs> to which Rice versus Cayetano and Morton versus Mankari applies in places that are not um, federally recognized. Um, it's complicated because, on the one hand, most constitutional issues in the territories have been um, examined under the Insular Cases Doctrine. So why even make this move to mainstream equal protection doctrine when the result will arguably be on uh, the losing end of indigenous peoples, right? Um, I've presented a similar talk elsewhere and um, in an indigenous conference and I was asked why, what's the big deal, that you're, you guys have exactly, or the Marianas people have exactly what we're trying to get here in the U.S. Uh, the problem for many uh, scholars and activists who write against the territorial incorporation doctrine or the insular cases doctrine is that that doctrine has been um, has promoted colonialism as well and the maltreatment and the promotion of second class citizenship of people in the U.S. territories. What does it mean when not all when the Constitution does not follow the flag? Uh, what are you, how can you be an American and a U.S. citizen when you don't have the complete enjoyment and rights and privileges of the U.S. Constitution? So there are, have been a lot of scholars and activists who have tried to move outside or who've argued to, for the invalidation of the territorial incorporation doctrine towards, um, and towards an application of mainstream or traditional eco-protection analysis. But then the problem, as I've mentioned, is Rice versus Cayetano and Morton versus Mankari. My goal here then is just to highlight how uh, the <coughs> difficulty of uh, these issues in a place that has been marginalized and remain invisible in so many ways. Um, I hope that you, well, the main takeaway for me and for what I hope you would get out of uh, my talk is to see that it's not, um, while it's complex to think about federally recognized tribes and the complex issues that are, that are there as well, it is equally um, difficult and challenging to consider what it's like for territorial peoples to examine um, their, uh, to, to promote their blood quantum land property laws and voting restrictions. Thank you. Half a day, half a day everybody. Um, my name is Julian Uggen. I'm from the island of Guam, one of the islands um, 
my colleague Rose just talked about. Um, in many ways, it's really good that I'm following her. But before I begin, I, I really want to say thank you to Abby Rolnick. I now it's a tradition of by now for me to come to UCLA Law School and thank Abby Rolnick right from the beginning. And I think in part because I'm always sort of surprised at the invitation, only because I never know really what's going to come out of my mouth, and I sort of take myself by surprise every time. And sometimes I come across very cheeky, and other times I come across as a lawyer. I, I don't know. There's many things that I do, but in my own life as a lawyer, uh, an international human rights lawyer, um, it seems like the lawyer in me actually gets subordinated and the writer gets privileged in so many ways. Um, so with that said, um, thank you very much for inviting me again. Um, so who are, the, who are my people, the Chamorro people? Um, interestingly enough, um, the indigenous Chamorro people are people who, want, who occupy both Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. That's what uh, the, the political, the Chamorros today politically organized under the, CN, the rubric of this Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, actually uh, f for roughly 4,000 years, um, Guam and CNMI wasn't split. Uh, we were only split in 1898. And so the Ch indigenous Chamorro people are the indigenous peoples of the Mariana Islands, an archipelago um, in the Western Pacific in a region known as Micronesia. Um, when people hear Micronesia, they often think about um, the Trust Territory Islands. Um, those islands are now uh, politically grouped as the Federated States of Micronesia, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, the Federated Sea, um, the Republic of Palau, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands. So all of us together occupy a space far away in the Western Pacific Ocean, <laughs> and we collectively are known as Micronesians. So the indigenous Chamorro people, of which I'm a part, um, we have been in the Mariana Islands for 2,000 years before Jesus. I, and I think that's a good way to say that. Um, I actually struggled with how I was going to frame my talk. And I, you know, they said at the beginning, these tickets of admission. Uh, my ticket of admission was, I don't know, it was like wrenched out of me, only because I realized in writing it that I had to make explicit many things for myself that have remained largely implicit. And that is how f infrequently I think about race. And, I, I, and, I, and I, I hope that doesn't come across as wildly unsophisticated, but I just, in, in the political project at issue in Guam, which is straight up outright decolonization, which includes an outright option for independence, race and sort of the U.S.'s particular relationship with race um, is so not a part of my daily life or the, the life that I, uh, the work that I do, as, even as a lawyer. Um, and sovereignty itself actually is also problematic for me only because my work centers around the fundamental human right of self-determination. So it's much more about peoplehood in, in some ways more than statehood. At least it's a, the Chamorro people, the people have an option to choose, since 1960 we've had three options, um, to choose how we want to organize ourselves. Um, so, I want to begin by trying to insert a new framework, hopefully one that doesn't problematize things, because God, some of the presentations for me, anyway, I don't know, I guess I'm just not that quick. Some of them, some of them were super dense to me, and, I, and I, I know that they were brilliant, I know, intuitively, I just couldn't access some of them. So, uh, but for, for me, uh, <laughs> Okay, so the framework that I'm using and I want to use today is not race and sovereignty but per se, but self-determination and the framework of a colony and a colonizer. Um, in UN parlance, that's a non-self-governing territory and an administering power. So, in beginning in 1945 with the UN Charter after World War II, the colonies of the world were basically sort of treated in a bifurcate manner. Um, the so basically the UN didn't provide a universal regime of decolonization. It actually recognized two categories of subjugated peoples to which two different legal regimes would apply. The first category of colonies is, was denominated as non-self-governing territories and was handled under Chapter 11 of the UN Charter. The second was denominated trust territories, and these were the colonies that, um, that were subjugated by the defeated Axis powers, which alone were entitled to explicitly to independence. And that's another thing I think it's important to know, and I think Mai Van Lam has brought this out many times. In international law, like these terms are super important because self-government, um, as it was used in the charter, um, re really proves that self-government does not mean independence under international law. But nonetheless, 
in, well, let me back up. CNMI was part of the trust territories governed under Chapter 12 and 13, and Guam was, you can see the split, was a non-self-governing territory governed under Chapter 11. Um, so 1960 rolls around, and the UN passes the Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples, commonly known as Resolution 1514. And this sort of amalgamated the two regimes, and basically said all, all the colonies are entitled to self-determination, which includes an option for outright independence. So since 1960, colonies such as Guam uh, were entitled to, um, uh, to independence. Um, hmm. so, so, okay, enter, um, enter the Mankari uh, situation and the racial political uh, binary. Um, on Guam, as a lawyer, I mean, I just realized part of my tasks is to sort of, there is no other, there, there are no constitutional laws, Ex, uh, focused lawyers in Guam, nor international lawyers in Guam, so in that way I sort of have a little bit of leeway to sort of play with cases that I don't know, uh, that I know are more nuanced than I suggest to the local legislature. Because when I'm in Guam, I use, I use Menkari to suggest, oh, there's precedent for, for uh, an exceptionalism for the indigenous peoples of the territories. Because if you have U.S. treats uh, indigenous peoples, though I know that means federally recognized indigenous peoples, but uh, on Guam, like, it, there's so much happening, and that's the last part of my talk, I'm going to actually talk about sort of the war zone that is Guam today and the hyper-militarization going on and how that sort of newly sort of makes very, very sort of pressing some of the questions that we have to sort of answer. Um, okay, um, where should I go now? I have lots of notes and obviously I've chucked them all out because I'm not sticking to any of the notes now. But um, I think in Guam, um, when I was um, first, first thinking about um, the race frame, I've understood it typically as a, 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 sta a, a, narrative, a legal narrative whose sort of political project is inclusion into the polity. It's sort of the notion of equality sort of preassumes oneness uh, of polity, but the whole colonial enterprise, the anti colonial enterprise, at issue in Guam and other colonies are sort of to throw off colonialism. So in Guam, what you have is a weird scenario because you have uh, an unincorporated, unincorporated territory for whom the only sort of doctrinal guidance ever given to us was a series of cases beginning in 1901 that Rose talked about called insular cases. To the colonizer, those cases are an incomplete instruction other than Congress has carte blanche with respect to the territories and can do whatever it wants. But to the colonizer, it's sort of like a constitutional black hole. So we never actually know what's constitutional or unconstitutional constitutional vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution. So, so it's a very interesting sort of murky, vague place to be in. Um, so well, one of the things I want to also talk about in terms of um, colonies is that a lot of people in Guam, they often talk about how sort of, at least the people at, to at the top of the island, the local elite, they often talk about how um, sort of I'm losing myself. I guess I'm getting too passionate. I have too many stories. I have like five more things to get through. Um, let me, let me, okay, this is a perfect way, perfect example. I'm going to talk now about the U.S. militarization of Guam. So here you have a colony that's sort of the world community via the United Nations General Assembly used as a colony. And the United States recognizes Guam as a colony. Guam is still on the list. There are only 16 colonies left in the world. And what's crazy, I'm starting to call it knee-jerk jurisprudence on Guam, is that the, the moment you try to do anything in terms of exceptionalism, in terms of saying, to articulate an indigenous rights frame, the moment you do any of that sort of work, um, what happens is it immediately gets framed as unconstitutional. And I sort of think we in Guam are, are very fortunate in a way because we don't have to sort of pour all of our political energy into sort of fitting into these ruthlessly tight conceptual conundrums that like Indian tribes have to go through or other, other groups in the United States have to go through because we in Guam are recognized as legitimately not the being part of the we of American life. It's sort of sort of the height of cynicism to hear the word unconstitutional on Guam actually because the you uh, it, to use the colonizer's constitution to judge the legality of our anti-colonial movement I don't know. You can do with it what you want, but it doesn't seem to work. It doesn't seem to fit very well. Um, so the military of Guam, um, I know I'm, I'm running low on time, right? Okay. Uh, 
Okay, um, so the military buildup on Guam, it was first announced in 2005, and it basically sprung from a bilateral agreement between the United States and Japan to send thousands of U.S. Marines from Okinawa to Guam, and that was in late 2005. Fast forward to 2011, you see the numbers much higher. Guam is a 30-mile-long island, and the, the total population is 168,000 people, very small, and the Chamorros make up 37% of that population. And now, with the military buildup, they're going to flood our island with some 80,000 new residents, which includes 8,000 U.S. Marines and 9,000 dependents, 1,000 Army personnel, um, 20,000 foreign laborers on military construction contracts, mostly coming from the Philippines. So, long story short, it's sort of a overnight human tsunami like that's happening on Guam because it's a sort of an injection virtually overnight of of a 40 42 to 50 percent increase in the entire population in a four-year window and we have once I mean I don't even I don't even know how to begin we have one dilapidated hospital where like there's 190 beds and we sort of have to it's it's weird because to be on Guam is sort of like to be uh, trapped in an asylum you don't really know how to make sense of what's going on because it, the U.S. is it, setting aside the colonialism the, this hyper militarization is now now of ethnocidal proportions I mean this really is this is ethnocide I mean among other things what's going on in Guam and so there's so the there's it's I don't know as a writer it's my one sort of um so, I don't know in Hawaii you would say we don't have an equivalent word in Chamorro at least not in this specific way but in Hawaiian you would say kuleana like a, an oblig a deep sense of obligation and I almost that's why I sort of I play around but truthfully I've privileged my work as a writer so much more than my work as a lawyer on Guam only because it's being really vested in the project of winning back people's imaginations. I mean, the legal imagination issue aside, I just think that Guam has been under a foot for so long, someone else's foot for so long, that it's sort of like colonialism, I, it sort of has had this, this unbelievably like vulgar and profane effect of sort of stripping away so much of our own imagination about how to how to think of things and I like this panel I like this conference because it's an opportunity to sort of say you know what I'm not gonna like try to do this again and throw myself on the funeral pyre of US congressional grace for my rights you know what I mean that's probably not in my best interest so I think I mean I mean and I and I don't mean to be so cheeky about it honestly I, I don't but I do see it as a funeral pyre because, and now let me just really quick take one minute to explain what's going on in Hawaii also because I split my time between Guam and Hawaii. I'm, I'm a post-JD fellow with the Kahuliao Center for Excellence in Native Hawaiian Law and in the wake of Rice Cayetano uh, versus Cayetano, there's, which I think has been partially misconstrued by lawyers trying to whip up a frenzy, trying to push Native Hawaiians to become a federally recognized Indian tribes to protect so-called race-based programs. There, I'm writing a paper right now. I actually am. I'm, I'm, I'm drafting it, but I finally settled on the title. It's called The Commerce of Recognition. Buy one ethos, get one free. And it's, it's sort of about all the things that are not legal, that are at issue in this sort of underground bartering of legal narratives. Because, you know, with Hawaii, it has a unique, sui generis legal genealogy where it was an independently recognized country. And then you have, so it's like, you have one set of legal fictions on the on on the one hand and an entirely another set of legal fictions on another hand and all of it's trauma all of it's sort of like this this unbelievably heavy yoke that we're trying and 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 you see that when you see that when lawyers argue post rise you that you see all these people within the US argue and it's so it's so unbelievably traumatic to sort of and I think that's part part of my work even in the paper it's a highly technical piece but I think it's true guts it's true beauty I actually rests in, in sort of my description of the limitations of international law. Basically how law, if indigenous peoples are looking for med, the medicine in law, they're not going to find it. Because I mean, really sort of talking about how this is not medicinal, this doesn't have the cure per se, but nonetheless using it, using it, understanding all of its shortcomings, using it, but understanding that all these other A legal things are also really important, if not the utmost important. Um, 
How much time do I have left? Time. <laughs> um, okay, um, I just, okay, I'm on time. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Kia ora koutou, ko Catherine Irons, toku ingoa, ko Aotearoa, toku rohe, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, thank you, Julian. Hard act to follow. I saw all these lovely typed papers this morning. I thought, oh my goodness, I didn't type a paper. I've got headings. Quickly ran and wrote them all out. And I think, uh, why did I bother? <laughs> I was just talked. Um, I'd like to add my voice to the thank you to the organisers, but especially um, from me, Angela, and uh, uh, to Angela and Aggie, for, um, for thinking I can help add something to the debate. I ho humbly hope I can live up to their trust. Um, in terms of the themes of the panel, I suggest that my examples illustrate a dance between race and sovereignty and indigenous rights. I'm not really defending sovereignty in particular. Oh, am I, am I not? I can try and sit further forward. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to take, actually, as my starting point, Addie's comments this morning in the first plenary um, that uh, the current US framework is neither natural nor unavoidable and is juridically produced, uh, she said. I thought that was a lovely quote. Uh, my contribution is just to discuss other ways um, in which these issues have been approached. Um, it's certainly to show the US position is not natural, uh, it is not um, unavoidable. Um, I'm not saying that these other suggestions would be the best ones for the US in particular, uh, as an example, but if you look at other examples, it certainly opens you up to other possibilities. Um, there are two parts to the presentation. I've got one um, first on Aotearoa New Zealand and then on some international human rights law. And now there are a lot of aspects of indigenous rights and claims in both New Zealand and international law that I think are relevant to themes of race and sovereignty. For example, I find worldwide um, sovereignty isn't argued for as much as self-determination. I've heard a couple of people comment on that today. Um, sovereignty is certainly seen as one way of achieving self-determination, um, but it's only an element of it. Um, so I'd observe just really that as a descriptor, self-determination is a better um, descriptor of the goal of indigenous struggles. Um, but interestingly, race per se has not influenced the eligibility of claims to self-determination or sovereignty. Um, instead, the status um, and history of authority over land, which is going to link to the panel, <laughs> has been um, determinative of why one particular group might be entitled to self-determination or sovereignty over another, um, or not. Um, indeed, in international human rights law, uh, the definition of the concept of indigenous peoples includes um, having a strong and special link to ancestral territories. And so thus some races of peoples are entitled to indigenous rights, but not simply because of their race. Right, so you get, it's the history of subjugation and oppression um, that entitles them to the human rights protection under, uh, under the international laws particularly. So it's almost like a circle, uh, in which I'll come back to the dance between race um, and uh, sovereignty and indigeneity. Now there are so many relevant aspects that if I look at them all then of course, like everybody, we're going to run out of time and we'll be once over lightly. So I thought what I'd do is just focus on one thing more thoroughly. Uh, I've chosen to use an illustration of electoral laws and rights of political participation. Um, I need not have, I could have looked at affirmative action laws or reparation settlements, um, for example, but the electoral laws are just an interesting illustration um, or an indication of participation in the nation state. Um, plus, uh, it's in contrast, and the, one, the examples I've got in contrast to the US position, so I thought it was a nice uh, um, illustration. So if I look at uh, New Zealand and Māori political participation, now first, uh, just by way of background, um, I'll note that New Zealand is quite a small country of 4 million, approximately 4 million people, um, of which Māori are 15% of the population. Um, and it was largely colonised in the 1800s. Right, with Ma uh, a main a significant treaty between Māori um, and the British government concluded in 1840. Um, and this, key, this treaty is key to indigenous politics today, uh, which is why I mention it. Um, and it's not until the 1860s when the settler population became greater than the Māori population, um, and which when you get all the land wars, you know, surpri not surprisingly then, as soon as you, have, and you think you've got the numbers and you think you can start a war. 
Um, and so we get the largest numbers, though, of uh, Māori moving off land to the cities, though not until the mid 1900s, so about 50 years ago. So we get 150 years effectively of starting to lose the land, and then in terms of the people moving away, trying to become integrated, only 50 years. So it seems all quite recent. Um, which I think is uh, certainly one thing to take into account um, in the socio-cultural attitudes. Um, the governmental system adopted in New Zealand is effectively British uh, with a unified sovereignty. We don't have separate states. We don't have separate um, uh, indigenous tribes, for example. Um, a separate Māori sovereignty was not recognised within the structure of the state, um, as it is in North America. Um, so instead, the government regards itself as the one unitary sovereign over all land in the country. Māori have always been recognised as full citizens, um, to, but to be integrated within the state, um, and not encouraged nor enabled to stay separated. So uh, it's a little bit of a different background, um, but you can, when you see the background, you see why people have chosen some tactics over another. Um, there is, so there is currently one parliament for the whole country, no upper house. Um, and so, so, with no tribal reservations, with separate government, um, uh, instead tribal organisations are more like private organisations, right, with no government authority. So in this context, you can see political participation within the mainstream state is particularly important. Um, and so Māori see p participation within the national parliament as a key goal. Um, uh, one of the elements of self-determination, not the only one, there's certainly, uh, and I think I probably mentioned somewhere else <laughs> um, uh, in the paper, that uh, separate sovereignty is certainly a goal in the future of a lot of Māori tribes. Um, but uh, at the moment, political participation, in, participation in national decision-making through parliament is a key goal. And unsurprisingly, it's been found that by and large, Māori interests have been furthered best through Māori representatives. Um, now, as far back as 1867, so right around the Māori land wars, uh, at the time of establishing colonial self-government, Māori were granted reserved seats in Parliament. Um, this was initially to enable representation because the enfranchisement required uh, individual land holding, of course, Māori owned land communally. But it was so it was seen as a temporary measure. Um, but uh, the early Māori representatives, interestingly, couldn't speak English, um, yet uh, proceedings in the House weren't translated, and so they were actually very ineffective at um, participating in government. Um, but despite this, uh, and even though over the years they stayed at four seats when the House grew to about 100 seats, Māori came, and we're talking over, say, 100 years, Māori came to value the seats so greatly when the option was uh, put to them of abolishing seats in favour of something practically more effective. And it was agreed that practically more effective, but symbolically Māori valued the seats so highly that, no, that it was seen as an attack on their, I say, personal mana, their respect and authority, um, especially authority under the treaty. Is where we get to, uh, I mean, seen as a treaty, uh, two parties to the treaty, and without symbolic representation directly in the House, you're seen as not to value the treaty anymore. Um, and Māori do uh, value the treaty as um, uh, some of, of a lot of status, um, including upholding their rights uh, as well as some. Uh, Arguable, arguably sovereignty under the Māori text. Long story, I'll leave that for on the side. Um, anyway, so, the, uh, so, so New Zealand has today a parliament and an electoral system that maintains race-based seats right, as a method of achieving Māori self-determination, but it's part of the sovereignty of a nation as a whole, right, rather than Māori separately. Um, now, I'll say right up front that even those who do value the Māori seats highly um, don't think of it as the ultimate expression of self-determination, um, but it's certainly worth fighting for at the moment. So how do these seats operate? Um, where does race fit in? First, you have a Māori electoral role. Right? Any person who is of the Māori race or a descendant of such a person can enrol on the Māori roll. There is no further definition of what counts as a person of the Māori race. There is no blood quantum requirement, for example. One merely certifies, you sign a bit of paper that says I am of the Māori race and ought to sign up, and there's no independent oversight or verification of your Māoriness. Um, but uh, go, note that going on the Māori roll is an option. Uh, you don't have to. Māori may instead elect to enrol on the general electoral roll with all the other New Zealand electors. Um, but it's, it's only Māori that have that choice, and it is a race-based choice. Um, the second step is that then Māori electoral districts are drawn up, 
um, based on the Māori electoral population. And particularly, it's not the only thing, but particular numbers on the roll. Um, so there's a figure of population size calculated for the general electorates, um, and then that same figure is used to establish the number of Māori electorates. Um, because we, that's one thing under general electoral law um, and democracy, you want all electorates to have the same population base so you don't distort the voting power from different people. Um, so the boundaries are then drawn up by physically dividing up the country simply by population size of those electorates. Um, so thus each district has a territorial boundary but they're not devised according to territorial criteria, if you know what I mean. Um, so traditional tribal areas, for example, can be taken into account but they can also be divided up um, bisected, uh, amalgamated, um, in order to get the right population size. Um, there's a population tolerance of 5%, plus or minus 5%, which is not very large, um, in order to try and accommodate traditional tribal boundaries. Um, and these are overlaid on top of the regular electoral districts. Um, so the third step is that candidates stand for election in these seats. Um, now, candidates need not be Māori. Right, which is interesting. Um, but they're elected by Māori royal voters and those who are selected have always been Māori. Um, and they're typically the least mainstream Māori, if you know what I mean. Um, and, and they're seen as expressions of Māori self-determination. Uh, and so you definitely get the stronger um, political views um, coming out of the candidates for those seats in favour of uh, Māori values and interests. And now, historically, it must be noted the seats, of course, have not been as effective at advancing Māori issues um, in Parliament, but mainly because of their low numbers, four out of 100, uh, now seven out of 121, um, and, but also partly because of the domination by uh, mainstream political parties. It would be like having Democrat or Republican uh, Indigenous seats in the House um, to, uh, here. And so you get candidates with divided loyalties between the party and their electorate. Um, but today, uh, a change to our electoral system has greatly enhanced or increased their influence um, and effectiveness. In the 1990s, New Zealand adopted a proportional representation system, which greatly increased the numbers of Māori MPs in Parliament. Um, it also increased other minorities. Uh, we had the first Rastafarian MP and a transgender MP, um, all because of proportional representation. I'm more than happy to elaborate on how well that worked and why that worked, um, if anyone wants. Um, but so now Māori MPs actually make up 15% of our parliament in proportion with their, uh, um, their proportion of the population. And notably, a Māori party, that's this name, the Māori party, um, holds the Māori seats and holds a balance of power at the moment in a coalition government. Um, so that's been very effective at uh, achieving policy outcomes favourable um, to Māori, including a lot more self-government, which they've been a lot more uh, increasing the capacity of tribes to self-govern matters, even if they don't have formal uh, constitutional status for that. There's constant debate in New Zealand about the appropriateness of race-based classification in New Zealand electoral laws. Um, these are arguments, especially the criticisms, that have been directly imported from the USA, which is very interesting. <laughs> we, the, business, the, the Conservative Business Roundtable imports US academics all the time <laughs> to come and suggest why we should be adopting an American approach to uh, affirmative action laws or not, you know, as the case may be, equality laws generally. A common reply in favour of retaining the Māori seats is Māori's different status from other minorities due to them being treaty partners. It's interesting, this is a political status argument, right? It's political status justification, even if it's implemented via race. Um, so uh, I suggest that holding um, affirmative action, upholding affirmative action on race in New Zealand is much more acceptable than on political sovereignty because we don't have the separate sovereignty idea, even though um, we achieve the implementation, which is defined through race, on a justification ground of um, historical sovereignty. But it's just more, much more palatable to the mainstream state. Um, that decision-making bodies, you know, such as Parliament, are made, up, um, with, uh, are made through an electoral process, even if it's race-based criteria, than through, say, for example, direct appointments from Māori organisations. Now, the great thing, I can see she's holding hard up, but I took my glasses off and I can't see the number. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I thought it was five. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you know, the, the glass is up and down with reading. Um, so, uh, anyway, um, where am I up to? So we have an irony, really, uh, in that in practice we can handle race, but not political sovereignty, but we use historical sovereignty, political sovereignty, the historical basis, as the justification for our preference on race. 
Um, if I look at other jurisdictions, maybe only two minutes. Okay. Um, New Zealand. I just comment. New Zealand is not alone in allowing special measures for political representation based on race or ethnicity grounds. Um, Europe, and not France, um, has a long history of allowing representation uh, systems designed to protect minority interests um, and particular named minorities. But there is not the strong support for it today that there used to be. Um, and European countries and judicial bodies um, have been a bit selective now about who is best protected. Uh, just as a, just that one illustration, um, the breakup of Yugoslavia and Bosnia's constitution prescribed uh, provided for special representation for Bosniaks, Croats, and Serbs in order to ensure that none of the groups would be sidelined in the future uh, government or electoral processes. But in December 2009, the European Court of Human Rights struck it down. Well, not struck it down. Said it violated the European Court of Human Rights. Um, due to its discrimination on the basis of race. So, uh, I mean, in what the mid 90s, when it was early 90s, when it was created, um, certainly the various governments that were party to it didn't think that this was going to there was anything wrong in terms of well, maybe they knew it was a bit different, but they certainly thought that wasn't a justified uh, response to a bad situation. Court says now that the situation doesn't exist, we can get rid of it. Which I think was a really interesting switch um, uh, in terms of the legal justification. Um, so in times of peace, you can't have race-based justifications um, or special provisions. Um, there's probably a lot of room for analysis, i.e. slash critique of the decision. Um, uh, so I've really uh, illumin contrasted it today. I've contrasted it in the paper that's still coming out, I think, and uh, from the one from last year. Um, uh, I contrast it with Latin America. Um, I just say I don't think it's the only permissible interpretation that the one the Euro European Court took, uh, at least in respect of indigenous peoples in, in, in international human rights law, there is um, a move towards more special measures in electoral participation, not less. And, and Latin America provides some really good examples of constitutional change in order to provide for special indigenous representation, separate autonomous areas, um, and they're all based on human rights standards. And I've got examples of Colombia and Venezuela with separate parliamentary seats, um, even though they're not elected through normal democratic processes, but through traditional um, communities processes. Uh, and I guess I won't mention about the Nicaragua autonomous regimes in detail, but I'll comment that the European, uh, no, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has upheld um, special uh, electoral measures designed to uh, take account of indigenous, um, uh, I guess, different uh, culture and practices and um, ensure that the electoral law is changed in order to accommodate that culture. That's completely the opposite of the European interpretation. All right. Now, is it because it's indigenous peoples and not other minorities? That's a really good question. Is there something special about indigenous peoples in terms of race and sovereignty? that you don't get in Europe with maybe just the race. They, they, they try and ignore the, um, the historical sovereignty um, issue. So it certainly could be explained on that basis. Um, but where do, so where does, that we, uh, where does that leave us? Possibly we've come full circle again. And uh, we have racially targeted special measures, racially defined, I should say special measures, but for historical grievance reasons. But where those grievances arose because of the assumption about racial superiority due to colonization um, and conquest. Um, so, which is on the you know race to, to sovereignty and back to race again, um, just because this is the case doesn't I mean it should be that way. But um, I certainly know that we have that different result when sovereignty is linked with race than when it's used alone. Um, so now I won't have time to talk about how sovereignty on its own fits into all this. Um, maybe we can comment that's the dance together. Um, I suggest that different dances have been and will be danced in different countries. But just because you've always danced the waltz doesn't mean you can't learn to tango. Good afternoon. What a wonderful panel. I am so honored to have learned from you guys. Thank you so much for those wonderful perspectives. And to our wonderful conference hosts, um, you guys have outdone yourselves. Um, just a wonderful, wonderful conference. And I I view it sort of like a, a painting coming into being or a symphony coming into being that there are all these different instruments or colors or anything and I'm trying to see the patterns and I think at the very end of the day there's always the chance to get confused. <laughs> Maybe. So I don't want to do that to you and I'm going to keep my presentation very focused around three things. 
First of all, we keep talking about sovereignty and self-determination. So I really want to talk about the themes that we're using to interrogate both of those, conference, those terms in this conference and what we mean when we make a choice to use one versus the other. The second thing I want to do is look at the challenges because both of those terms describe a certain status and there are a number of status challenges both internationally and domestically which I think give us some of the, the uh, ideas of, of what the resistance is to those concepts and to the use of those concepts. And then finally I'm going to talk about what it means at the end of the day before you get into tomorrow um, where we further look at that, so some, some kind of concrete uh, applications. And um, before I do that, I want to say a big thank you to UCLA, to the Critical Race uh, program here, Critical Race Theory Scholars. This is a who's who and to the American Indian Studies Center. You provide such a wonderful, wonderful home where this type of thinking can happen. Any students here, UCLA students? Yes! The only thing relevant in my bio is BA, UCLA, JD, UCLA. <laughs> I'm in my intellectual home and really happy, happy to be here. And I'm also relieved. I can breathe. I noticed how nervous I was in the morning because people would say things and I would go, because if you said that in Arizona, <laughs> oh my goodness. And I do have my dear colleague students from Arizona. They're, they're here to join me in this wonderful safe space where you can say anything you want and people actually applaud you for it. Julian, yes! <laughs> okay, so let's just have fun and, and, and do a little bit of thinking as, as we wind down toward question and answer. Okay, so sovereignty and self-determination. I just love that guy this morning. I'm sorry to call him. I, I didn't get his name, but he went up to the microphone and he said, would you please define sovereignty? I was like, yes, I think we should do that. So as, as I look at it, there there um, sort of three themes that were posed to us in the panel which involve very different uses of sovereignty, right? So the first one is sovereignty as political ideology. The meaning of native group identity as a nation, as a people, or as a tribe. Uh-oh. Okay, so are those things the same? Are they different? Why would you choose one versus another, assuming that they all have some level of sovereignty? So, and, and they posit, is there a racial grounds for that? Second one, sovereignty as a sense of material power. It's power, but it has a material component. And that is the rights talk, right? What are the rights of a sovereign? And are those rights equal rights? If you took those three labels, nation, people, tribe, what are the rights of those three entities? Are they the same? Are they different? So there's a material component. And the third one is sovereignty as resistance, that oppositional framework where you look at racism and you use sovereignty to resist the racism. So what themes are you using if sovereignty is resistance? Um, and I take it that in all of those senses, with perhaps the exception being the ideology one, because there, obviously, there's, there's a certain level of consciousness that you're playing with where you're constructing a meaning. And that's one of the problems that I had all day. I w this whole notepad, it started out empty at the beginning of the day. That's it now. Because I was furiously taking notes, like Professor Goldberg, man, I, I was really taking notes on that, right? Because everything was, was out here and I had to bring it in and make it relevant in my law professor mind. And how was I going to do that, right? So I kind of got stuck. So there's a level of consciousness happening there. And I think my consciousness has definitely been expanded, but we won't, we won't go there. Okay. So. 
Now, when we're looking at all those uses, it, they're instrumental. They get us something that we want. Well, what's the difference then with self-determination? And this is something I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking on. So in, in a lot of the jurisprudential you know, readings on self-determination, they talk about uh, self-determination as a moral construct, right? If a people have the right to self-determination, that's a moral right that can't be taken away from them, that there's some inequality that happens, some discrimination that happens, and you have to rectify that. And that's the whole basis, for example, in the reparations discussion, right? There might be a number of groups with claims, but only some of them are going to permeate to that level. So do we have a moral claim to self-determination, and if so, what does that mean? And we talk about all of these uh, stages on the level so that if we look at this idea that if we have the right to make our ultimate choice about our destiny, if we used our sovereignty in the fullest sense to make that choice, that would look one way. But if we use our sovereignty to, for example, contribute to political campaigns in the United States in a representational way, to vote in, in that representational way. It's a use of power, it's a use of self-determination, but it doesn't look the same way. What if we say, let's go look it up in the U.S. Code, 25 U.S.C. What's self-determination in 25 U.S.C.? The right of a tribe to manage a federal program, got some constraints there. They can, it's a self-management model. So all of those are models of what we might think of as self-determination, but they're very, very different. And, and so I really want us to think about how we use those terms and to use them uh, carefully. Now, kind of bridging into what, what you know, what, what we're going to construct here, I want to look at three different levels of the law, right? So if you look at international human rights, and I really appreciate the presentation uh, the professor made earlier. Obviously, you had been with it for the whole time. I mean, that was fascinating. That history was absolutely fascinating. They never saw it coming in that first meeting in the room, right? Good for you. Okay. so. There, you know, we're, we're talking about this idea of political rights, about cultural rights, and the equality of peoples. So when I look at that document that finally came into being in Article 2, it says indigenous peoples and individuals are free and equal to all other peoples and individuals. That's a really interesting sentence, just that. So there's an equality as peoples, and then there's an equality as individuals within the society, and obviously the anti-discrimination norm is very powerfully represented there. Um, in terms of the, the idea of federal Indian law, that's the second thing. So our domestic federal Indian law, we've had some presentations on the, the wonderful coveted, apparently, federally recognized Indian tribe, also known as the domestic dependent nation. Okay, so what does that mean? Where does that fit? Is a domestic dependent nation a people? They are sovereigns and they are racial groups. But there is a tendency to want to deny the racial component in favor of the political component, which is why blood quantum and disenrollment and blah, 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 that has taken on a new life in terms of political power versus racial status. I would say that racism is always embedded there. And so if you, if you look at the, the case like Montana, you know, the famous case that basically took away the, the Bighorn River from the, you know, from the Crow tribe and, and, you know, looked at fee land and da da da. There is a component of racism which they were the first to acknowledge there, saying it's not a sovereign, it's a racial group that's just managing other people and certainly can't manage white people. That would be impermissible because they can't participate in the government. Same thing in the Pacific Northwest and Michigan fishing cases. There's always a racial component. It always takes down sovereignty. You can't deny it. 
You have to engage it. It's a dual status, and so to the extent that we make them inconsistent with one another, we leave the door open for what happened in Rice versus Cayetano. Because then the court constructs it as a multiracial group, a multiracial group living under the charter of the U.S. Constitution <laughs> in their equal rights of citizenship. No longer are they the sovereign nation. So the, the space there was completely eclipsed. And I think that we need to be very careful about, again, delinking them and making it clear what we're talking about. Um, in, in terms of, of the work and, and health policy that I've been doing, it's very interesting to me because there, the, the status, the political status is pivotal to the separate health system that operates for members of federally recognized tribes. And yet if you look at the health disparities literature, it is racial. Right? Because that's what tells you the measure of art. art. Do they have health equity? And the answer is no. It's one-sixth of that for white Americans. That's a pretty big gap. Uh, so I think that, that that is something that we need to uh, engage. We're also asked to look in this panel at, is there an alternative discourse? So we're looking at the language of sovereignty. We're looking at the language of self-determination. Is there an alternative discourse? And there, the, the article that I wrote several years ago about cultural sovereignty was an attempt to create that type of an alternative. If you look at an alternative epistemology within a tribal community about how we look at the powers that are relational within the community and between that community and external communities. That gives you a much different lens on all of the concepts that we are talking about in this conference. And there are people in the audience who, who work on that and, and do wonderful work on it. Um, so I want to say that if we look for solutions, and, and I was writing down, all morning I was writing down people talking about different problems. There was the Indian problem, the difference problem, the equality problem, and a host of other problems that I, I probably missed. And, and I kept thinking of that quote that Einstein said, you know, that, that you can't solve any problem by using the type of thinking that you use to create the problem. And I thought, well, that's it, right? Because there has to be this alternative, which is exactly what this conference is devoted to. That's why I love it. It is a transformation in consciousness that looks at the problems but isn't stuck there. It is transcendent of that. And I also thought of the, the line that it, in, in the principle of healing in, in a lot of traditional cultures, they say you, you actually have to incorporate whatever the source of the disease or discomfort is that you have to incorporate. You can't just resist it, right? Because if you just resist it, it's still out there and it's still oppressing you or potentially harmful. But if you incorporate it and transform it, then you get the healing. So I thought, well, that's exactly what we have to do. Now, how do we do that, given the, the nature of what we have? Well, I say, look at the challenges. And look at the challenges and solutions in five minutes. OK, maybe just challenges. Um, but in, in terms of international human rights law, what I see going on in terms of the challenges, a couple of things. Who can be a people? under an indigenous people under the UN Declaration. They didn't define it, obviously, rightly so. But now everybody's kind of interrogating that, right? Because if we make it so comprehensive that it includes anybody with any long-standing relationship to land, say, I mean, then you just dilute it, right? And then everybody potentially has a claim. And that's why Waldron you know, has his whole you know, cosmopolitan citizen, hey, we just pick and choose and we, we do what we do. Um, so that's a big one. The second one, what meaning will be given to the right of self-determination as a people? To the extent that you fall within that, is it really an equal right? Are all peoples really entitled to the same bundle of rights under international law, under self-determination <coughs> theory? And I think that that's, a, that's a, still a very hot uh, topic, even though Obama ultimately says, well, it's just the same as federal Indian law, right? Right. Okay. Um, and the third one, 
you know, always lurking in the background is, is that distinction between the minority, ethnicity, racial, that whole thing, and then the, the political, you know, so that was embedded in the covenant on civil and political rights. It's still embedded. I think in the in the text of the declaration, although they do a wonderful job of kind of making it very inclusive in all the articles, but it is still embedded in that covenant, I mean in the declaration. So I think that that's what we would have to think. If the declaration became a covenant, what would you want that to say? Um, the, the, um, in terms of domestic law, a lot of the issues that we're dealing with now in terms of federal recognition, see there are a lot of tribes out there, definitely native people, non-recognized tribes that are legitimate but are saying, well does that mean we have human rights now to do this or that, to claim our territories, to claim our resources versus the federally recognized tribes who already have their structure. So does that mean they have to welcome the interloper? Or is that a special status designation? And that was really an interesting political divide in terms of the discussion about the federal recognition of Native Hawaiian people. If you would you put them in the Bureau of Indian Affairs mm -mm. in a different place, right? Because then there would be a different space and, and potentially coexisting. But would it be the same in terms of resources? I think we really have to be careful of that idea of dependency that is at the heart of federal Indian law because it. it puts in this, you know, to the extent that we exclude, we preserve the entitlements and benefits. To the extent that we become too inclusive, we dilute our fishing rights, our water rights, our land rights, all of that stuff. And I know we don't want to talk about that, but I think we have to talk about it because they're all talking about it. Don't think they aren't. So better that we would talk about it first. Now, why does it matter kind of in the end and some of the, the current claims? Um, I, I, I absolutely think there's a parallel between aboriginal rights and that idea of the preemptive right of the European sovereign and this idea now on reservation land bases to look at the privileged status of the non-Indian fee simple landowner as preemptive of native rights. I mean, there is a parallel in that thinking, and that is just going to continue. Um, the, the idea of who owns the resources, the, the, you know, and I, Angela Riley is the leading authority on lots of this, um, but, but certainly the, the work in terms of cultural resources in, in NAGPRA, who's, that, that Bonickson case delinking Native American from indigenous. There were some other people here that are indigenous and they were the original people with all the rights and then these Native American people came and, you know, so they're just kind of the second wave. And that is it. Bioarchaeology hooks right into the fight over Native DNA. My colleague Kim Tallbear sitting there, the, the leading authority on that. See, you guys have a bunch of leading authorities in the audience right there. You know, there is a link in that. Who owns that DNA, that lineage that tells you who the identity is of the true indigenous people? And finally, that idea of indigeneity as property, and, and, and I'm just drawing on, on Cheryl Harris's wonderful article about whiteness as property, it's only contentious now because indigeneity is linked up to power and privilege and resources. That's why it's contentious now. So, fundamentally, that's where I'm going to stop in terms of the idea of what's, what's at the heart of the matter, what does equality mean, and how do we heal from that past. So, thank you. Wow. Whoa. Is this on? Hello? Can you hear me? Well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much um, for that conversation. And I really love that we got uh, so many different perspectives uh, in terms of the panelist viewpoints, but also so many different examples from around the world, which really are helpful to illuminate some of the discussions we're having here around both race and sovereignty. So I do have a question to kick things off. And um, I think any, any or all of you could answer this question, um, so I'll leave it up to you if you, if you all want to take a stab at it. It's, it's a pretty straightforward um, question coming out of the panel, but not one that I think was specifically addressed in the presentations. And that's the question of whether 
whether and what you think about um, whether the move towards articulations of political sovereignty as opposed to just expressed collective racial or ethnic identity unnecessarily bifurcates questions of race from issues of colonization and oppression of indigenous groups or is it really a valuable distinction that has successfully facilita facilitated claims to self-determination by indigenous and other minority peoples so I guess at the heart of it how useful is sovereignty um, and how do we think about it in the context of claims of peoples and we've talked a lot you've talked a lot about peoples who don't necessarily have sovereignty at least not in the um, American sense um, in the way that Indian tribes here have sovereignty but have uh, rights to self-determination or who may um, identify themselves more by a shared collective racial or ethnic linguistic cultural history um, so how useful is sovereignty in this movement anyone <laughs> I can comment, well, one thing I didn't um, get to mention is that um, we do have a lot of, say, affirmative action and race-based measures like reparation settlements that, that's it. again, they say on their face they don't depend on sovereignty, but of course it's the political history of once we're sovereigns, you know, that matters. But we also are quite accepting of, for example, affirmative action uh, in various fields, you know, employment, education, things like that, not with, for other minorities. Um, much more accepting than you have been in America um, more recently, you know. Uh, and so you can have uh, you, sovereignty is not absolutely necessary um, for. Uh, I mean, we don't have your traditional type of sovereignty, and yet we still make reparative measures um, and try and redress grievances. Uh, have, try and have the decision making capability, and we still have some tribes arguing for increased sovereignty. Um, but I, whether I don't know, you can say it's unhelpful to try and divorce it. And, but it's just say it's just it's just another way of doing it, mm -hmm. um, and it's not absolutely necessary. But if you've got it, you know, sometimes people find it a useful tool. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll take a, I'll try to take a quick stab. Um, I guess I would re. <laughs> I guess I'll argue with the question a little bit and maybe rephrase it. Um, because in the, in the U.S. context, it's not a move to political sovereignty. It's, of course, a received construct. Um, and I guess I didn't think that's so important for understanding what I think to indigenous nations here is the way forward, I think, at least from their perspective so far as I can know that. Um, because the legal construct of sovereignty, again, is as freighted with colonialism and racism as it is and has been for tribes, is also, of course, the site of their agency and self-determination. I mean, that's just the way it is in these here United States. Um, and so I almost feel like even just phrasing it that way, once again, misdescribes, and I know you didn't, I know, and not, you didn't misdescribe, but, but that, that uh, mis, misdescribes the situation in a way that can obscure these differences that I think um, that Catherine so rightly points out. Like, we are, we are stuck with our history and our culture and our legal constructs and the way they all, you know, bleed into each other and so forth. And, and so we could try to imagine what it would be like to be New Zealand um, or Australia, right? These are the kinds of counterfactuals we talk about in class, or Canada, um, or, or the Northern Mariana Islands, or any place. But, um, but you know, that, that kind of thinking and reimagining uh, is helpful at moments when there's some space, but then you can't obscure, of course, the situation that we all came from. So I'll stop there. <laughs> I, um, and, oh, sorry, can I add? Uh, yes, of course. And while Julian speaks, please feel free to make your way to the microphone if you have a question. Okay, um, just in the spirit of, of flipping the question also, I, I, I think I, I forgot to say something in my presentation about how useful race has become in Guam by opponents of the anti-colonial struggle. For example, um, U.S. lawyers sort of in mass have been coming to Guam to give lectures in the community saying that 
all U.S. citizens who come to the territory, to the unincorporated territory, i.e. colony of Guam, all U.S. citizens get to vote in the self-determination <laughs> referendum scheduled for three years from now. Guam has a self-determination vote, a referendum scheduled for 2014. And the, that's the U.S.'s official formal pronouncement that any U.S. citizen there, I don't know, I think someone even made the, had the hubris to say that anyone there for 30 days gets to vote. Because otherwise it would be unconstitutional. And I think sort of like that sort of how useful, I mean, I'm not saying race is only this, but it's really sort of become a really handy tool for people in Guam or in situations like this trying to thwart our decolonization movement. Um, and, you know, the issue of the peoples, the issue of the self and self-determination is, you know, as we all, at least a lot of us are talking about, is really problematic. And, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. International law works from general principles and, a, and then a applies them to the specific fact pattern before it. And in certain cases, such as Guam and New Caledonia, for example, the colonized group are also at origin an indigenous people. So the indigenous people are the colonized people, are the people who are harmed, entitled to the remedy of decolonization. So it's, it's not just a race, and I was talking to Rose uh, earlier about this, for like places like Guam, it's not necessarily a race-based thing to say that Chamorro people are entitled to, um, de the, to the right of self-determination and the remedy of decolonization. It's a time-specific thing. So when did the harm occur? So then you know, by the, if you get to that, the answer to that question, then you know who is entitled to the cure. Laura? Um, thanks. Uh, that was a fabulous panel, and I thank you all for, you were all so clear and, and, and just so um, accessible, and I, I really appreciate the, the comments. I, I think I have a comment more than a question, and you may or may not want to respond to it. Um, and I take very seriously the, the trade-off that I think just, Sarah, in your last remark that you were suggesting there in the real political dynamic of, of um, wanting to define a racial category separately from a political category. But I guess I want to push on that distinction and really challenge whether or not that isn't a false dichotomy because the racial categories are as much politically, militarily, legally constructed, of course, as the political categories, right? And so there's no, whether we're talking about the DNA in terms of Kim Talbert's research, she just walked out, I think, probably to the restroom or something, or the ancestral definitions, or, or you know, whatever, whatever definition of race that we wanted to use, right? It's as much politically constructed as the quote unquote political categories, right? And so what I'm struggling with um, as, and, and this again could be a reflection of, as some of you mentioned, the, um, the length of the day and the ideas, so many ideas and, and such, but I'm struggling with this fact that of almost all the groups that we've talked about today, all the various examples from various parts of the world, um, from various time periods from, of, of, of so many types. We could, at any given time, those groups could have been constructed as uh, indigenous groups, whatever we would mean by that concept, or as uh, political categories, i.e. federally recognized tribes, or as racial categories. And many of them have been back and forth in those categories, right? But so, you know, I, I struggle with that reality and complexity while at the same time realizing that there are real political and material, especially, Rebecca, as you reminded us, ramifications of these choices today, right? So sort of how do we, how do we put the reality of that, that the truth of that reality and that history together with the fact that there are real resources at stake and real political battles at stake, right? So that's kind of where where I am after your wonderful talks. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just uh, say something brief about that. Um, I think uh, the way that I would address that would be to bring us back to the Supreme Court case that helped to, to construct the meaning of uh, political uh, political status or political group, right? Morton versus Mankari. And uh, the federal recognition tribal process that emerged, or that was part of that as well. Um, the Native Hawaiians, for instance, uh, the, the criteria that's the, that Sarah talked about in obtaining federal tribal recognition um, doesn't up, can't ever apply to Native Hawaiians, right? Because by, just because of the, the way that 
uh, and you can probably say a little bit more about the criteria, but just by operation of law, Native Hawaiians can't even apply for it. It doesn't, um, and also people in the Mariana Islands and Guam, so the law is limited already to begin with, which then creates, the law constructs who is considered a political group, and as a result, everybody else outside of that right now, as articulated by the Supreme Court, is thereby a racial group, which is, uh, which is ridiculous. Right, that's a, it, it has le least of harms and injustice that many of us uh, um, have felt, lived experiences of people. And so the challenge is to try to transform um, precisely what uh, the language, uh, the idea of transforming and changing the legal narrative, the landscape, towards something, a, mu a much more just uh, place where claims of, uh, of indigenous groups who are not considered to be politically recognized tribes will also be addressed. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to think between um, Sarah and Julian's points. Julian, you were saying, I think that your language was something like um, throwing ourselves on the funeral pyre, pyre <laughs> of congressional grace. I think it was, it was something like that. Um, and which is a great phrase, right? But Sarah's point that um, this, in some ways, this is the system that we have. Right, and so I think it's one of the, the great innovations of critical race studies over critical legal studies to say we can't simply say wish we were in a better world, right? Because there's damage being done in this world, and we have certain tools, right? We need to kind of take the, up those languages, those legal languages, and utilize them in ways that can um, remediate things now. But um, in thinking about, and this is from um, Rose's presentation, the relation between Morton v. Van Kari and um, race v. Cayetano. Right, that we can think about one is what, what? Oh, rice. Sorry, rice. <laughs> rice v. Cayetano. Um, that we can think about one as about pol political identity and one is about race. Right. Another way to argue it is that um, the U.S. government, because of its exercise of plenary power, right, it simply generates categories. Right. And it could be politics one day, it could be race another, it's domestic dependent nation, it's citizenship, it's allotment, right? And that plenary power becomes this um, sort of state of exception through which indigenous peoples can be subjected to whatever statuses the U.S. wants to generate and that that state of exception is actually fundamental to the settler state because it's only by placing indigenous peoples in a state of exception that then you can justify the exertion of U.S. authority over territory, quote unquote, within the United States, either domestically or in terms of the territories. So again, thinking about that, not wanting to throw yourself on the funeral pyre of um, you know, congressional grace, but also here's where we are, how can we go about challenging and eliminating the plenary power doctrine? Well, there are, um, uh, you know, nine people standing in the way, and they're all in Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, on, on a cheery note, however, on, on that front, um, apparently uh, I, I've heard through... Uh, the sort of law professor gossip grapevine that um, that uh, Justice Sotomayor is very interested in American Indian law and wants to give herself a crash course in the field. Um, and I, I, I'm thinking, based on who told me this, that that means she's interested in, in the same way that we all are. Not, not, not <laughs> there could be all kinds of ways, and, and there could be all kinds of resources one could look at that we wouldn't want someone to give themselves a crash course. But anyway, that's not that's just a one vote. Um, so I, I, I mean, that's, it's a big, big problem. I guess my, my practical response to that is and has been for a while, um, and litigators and the NARF and everyone in the field agrees, is to stay out of the Supreme Court. I mean, there's just no really, nothing really good that's going to come there in terms of reforming that judicial doctrine. And um, when I um, defend the rule of Morton versus Moncari in this paper and, and in general, um, I have I have I have a footnote. <laughs> it's a it's it's a big one, not textually, but um, in its import, which is that where it has gone wrong is is not the decision itself, but its subsequent interpretation, which is that it means no deference to any kind of discriminatory federal practice against Indians. Right? Natty talked about that. She's gone now, but um, right. So th there there there's there's lots of doctrinal, I guess, normative wishful thinking that I think we should all continue to engage in. <laughs> Um, to remind the deci federal decision makers to which um, we are all subject that this state of things is not satisfactory. Um, so 
we can and all should continue to do that. So, so sticking with what is doesn't mean accepting mm -hmm. all of its um, racism. <laughs> Um, if I could just add an informational data point on that. So this is the topic of plenary power. I, I don't really see us going anywhere with plenary power right now, but there there is sort of in the Indian law canon, as you all know, some cases that contain some extremely still racist language of savagery and um, and, and really horrible racist language that continue, they, those cases continue to get cited in contemporary Supreme Court cases. Um, Walter Echo Hawk has written a book called The Ten Worst Indian Law Cases Ever Decided. Um, um, and he is right now, I think, speaking a lot about the book and promoting the book, and he's working with a group of people, probably lots of people in this room and other people, including my tribal chairman and Tim Coulter of the Indian Law Resource Center, um, to talk about litigation strategies that are baby steps to see some of those old cases um, overturned and to stop having them cited in the Supreme Court. Um, cases that, that in the Indian law world, you know, we think of as the Dred Scott cases. So, um, it's, it's not, it's, it's not overturning plenary power. Um, but it is little baby steps to start to chip away at some of the racism that's embedded in the history of Indian law in this country. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there that uh, you might check out Walter Echo Hawk's book on that. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Kilani? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to follow up on a few different threads, and some of this is um, lingering from last night and building on what Maivan Lam um, stated in response to Addie's presentation. And I came out of another uh, one of the concurrent sessions where Rice v. Cayetano was also um, being discussed. And I just want to put some uh, points of clarification out on the table. I'm really troubled that Rice v. Cayetano is being positioned as the counterpoint to Morton v. Mancari in talking about this racial versus political binary. And part of it, I think, might be because people keep saying the Rice case, but not the Rice v. Cayetano case. It's not Rice v. Native Hawaiians. It's Rice v. Governor of Hawaii at the time. And I just want to remind people that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is a state agency that has been in the business of oppressing Native Hawaiians since its inception in 1978. And they've actually been using trust fund money to try and bankroll a campaign to try and force recognition down our throats, which in the Native Hawaiian context, unlike, say, New England, where I reside, where there's a backlash against tribes seeking federal recognition that would actually afford tribes a modicum of self-determination, in the Hawaiian case, it is about stripping away our unextinguished claim to state sovereignty under international law, state with a capital S. And part of that is that the other reason it's not a counterpoint to Morton v. Mancari is Rice v. Cayetano, the ruling had nothing to do with the 14th Amendment. The court made a very narrow ruling only based on the 15th Amendment, and it said it would not touch the 14th Amendment because it didn't have to, because it wasn't Native Hawaiians in some political organization trying to conduct a vote, like a quasi-tribal government. It was the state. These were state elections, and the state was conducting racially exclusive voting. There's just absolutely no question. And also, there, there wasn't even an alignment between the trustees and the beneficiaries of the trust, because the trust has been constructed for those Native Hawaiians who meet the 50% blood quantum rule, something I've written an entire book about and I'm opposed to. However, the tr there was no alignment between the trustees who could be of any Hawaiian background, so that was actually faulty reasoning on the part of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. We have to remember who argued the Rice case on behalf of Cayetano. It was John Roberts, right? Cayetano vetoed every single Native Hawaiian bill who, that came onto his table in two terms. This was Rice and Cayetano versus Hawaiian-only voting. Native Hawaiians were not party to the case at all. And the other thing I want to put out, because you raised the question of plenary power, and Julian's put that on the table, is that uh, federal recognition, <laughs> people keep talking about the Hawaiian, Hawaiians not having federal recognition, and that's why Rice ruled as it did. And again, that's just a misreading of the case, right, because it's a state-run <laughs> elections. But the other thing is that people have been kind of suggesting in different points and conversations along the way since yesterday that federal recognition is a means to protect Hawaiians from 14th Amendment challenges, which is a farce. That is a narrative constructed by Senator Daniel Inouye and Senator Akaka to try and get Hawaiians to actually consent to something. We have absolutely no record of acquiescence to U.S. governance in Hawaii. 
Not one of our treaties was a treaty of session. We recognized the globe, over, the globe over until 1893 and the overthrow of the kingdom. And it's a very different politics of recognition. I'm not saying that the sovereignty is better. I'm talking about a different kind of genealogy of recognition as, an, as a state with a capital S under international law. The federal recognition that's being pitched in Hawaii by Akaka is being shopped around not just as a protective measure for 14th Amendment challenges to Native Hawaiian funding, which is also a joke because the whole reason we've ever had funding is precisely because we don't have federal recognition. <laughs> Senator Inouye goes, goes and gets that money and has gotten it since the 70s saying, give the poor Hawaiians funding because they don't have what tribes have. That funding at its high point was less than one half of the percent of the state annual Hawaii budget, which is a stat that Randy Kekoa Ki, who's in attendance here, pointed out to me. And the whole idea is that if you get federal recognition, the funds go away anyhow. So the, the pushing the sort of notion that you've got to get federal recognition to protect you from the funds that are going to be disappearing once recognition is in place, to me was kind of a cruel joke, but it gets worse. And this is the last thing I'll say, because I don't want to eat up whatever time, but the thing about the federal recognition and the Akaka Bill uh, the Akaka Bill has never promised parity for a Native Hawaiian governing entity. It has said from the get-go that the state of Hawaii would have civil and criminal jurisdiction over that Native Hawaiian governing entity. And also it says very clearly that there will never be land held in trust for, Native, for that Native Hawaiian governing entity. So no territory and no jurisdiction. That's just another club. In, you know, that's just another club. There's nothing about it that's actually even self-governing within the modicum. And part of it, again, is there's no, there's not one site of evidence of Native Hawaiian acquiescence to U.S. rule. The Akaka Bill, if it ever passed, which right now it's actually in a state legislative version right now because it was at a standstill at the Congress after, you know, almost 11 years. If it ever passed, <laughs> well, part of it is you'd have basically the morning after you'd have the Hawaiians jumping in to become the Native Hawaiian governing uh, entity, and that would be the first ever evidence of Native Hawaiian acquiescence. And that has to do in part with what Maivon brought up on the panel earlier. Not only did anybody was anybody able to vote in that plebiscite in 1959, that included military personnel voting in the UN, uh, not the UN plebiscite, we were denied the UN plebiscite. So I just want to make sure that when people keep referring to the Rice case and also to the federal recognition proposal, we're not even talking about anything near what most tribes in the lower 48 have. And I know there's exceptions if you look at the Maine Claim Settlement Act and some of the East Coast tribes, but I just want to make sure that we have some, some of the basic facts clear. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, so I think we have time for a 30 to 45 second closing thought by what, if one of our panelists has anything they would like to add before we close. Oh, okay. I don't know if this is worth saying, but this is sort of in response to the last question by... Know, sorry, Maddie. sorry. Addie, Addie gets to ask a question. Oh. Go ahead, Julia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh so, wait. Go. You? What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, real quick. I, I guess it's not really an answer, but I just, it's sort of a worry for me. I mean, with your question, like sort of it's sort of at all times we're sort of left with the ultimatum like we just have to go with the best we can get right now and I guess I have the power I mean I have the luxury of being so far from America proper being in Guam being so far away that I just don't have an imagination that's chained to the idea of permanent American Empire like I really don't like I don't see it as inevitable I see it as contingent I see it as waning it's on its way out like and so I don't feel like the, the need to sort of you know, jump into the nearest available box, you know? So I, I, I think if that can answer your question. Yeah. Addie, as the organizer and intellectual light of this whole conference, you get to ask the last question. <laughs> I'm going to try to make sure. I have pages of notes about questions. And so this is sort of a suggestion, but really I want it to be a question. Um, one thing I might take from some of these presentations is that it is liberatory to be able to for groups that can step outside the framework of political, restrictive political and restrictive racial, and that that is good because it permits us on a practical level, a concrete level and sort of an imagination level to leave those concepts behind. Um, and like you said, Julia, in your presentation before that, then there's sort of no need to think about something like race. 
Um, and when it's brought up, it's brought up in the way that you described by whites to, um, against indigenous people, and that happens in Indian law as well in America. Um, so I just want to suggest that this is one particular interpretation of race that is linked to a particular project of colorblindness or post-racialism. And I don't, so I'm troubled that I feel like we're accepting that when we have that conversation. And that I, if I gave you, let, there are many definitions I could give you of race, but if I gave you a definition that just said that racialization involved a process in which a group was uh, assigned to, uh, a non-white identity and subordinated on that basis, then I, I'm sort of, I don't understand what Angela was asking in the beginning, which is what's the purpose of delinking that story from colonization? Why, why shouldn't we keep talking about race in the context of colonization if I gave you at least that understanding of it? Oh. <laughs> I, could we take that as a comment and discuss it over a glass of wine in the courtyard? <laughs> My apologies, but I can see people are ready to get up and stretch their legs. Thank you so much for bearing with us. Enjoy the reception. We'll see you back here for the keynote. Thank you.